Welcome or welcome back to the company of the cat. Hi. Today we are diving into one of the most intriguing, divisive, and underappreciated political plot lines in the Dance with Dragons, the chaotic situation in Slaver's Bay. This book picks up where a storm of swords left off and runs concurrently with a fist for crows, focusing on Daenerys Targaryen's struggle to rule Mirin after conquering the city. The newfound freedom of the former slaves is under constant threat from the Sons of the Harpy, a group of Giscari nobles who seek to reinstate slavery and remove Daenerys from the picture. The Harpy is allegedly the mastermind behind this resistance, though many, including Daenerys herself, doubt that a single person is pulling the strings. One popular theory in the fandom is that Galaza Galare, the Green Grace, is secretly the Harpy, and in this video I'll dive into why Galaza being the Harpy would be a brilliant plot point both narratively and thematically for the next book, and why it makes so much sense. We'll also explore the characters of Hizdar Zolorak and Skahas Mukandak, and most importantly, we will dive into how Giscari culture has been reduced to a shadow of its former glory, and why ending slavery isn't about erasing their culture, but about preserving what's left of it. And of course, we'll discuss the so-called peace in Mirin, which is anything but peaceful. But before we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy my content. A Dance with Dragons progresses the story in Essos more than any previous book, with events unfolding through multiple POVs, Daenerys, Tyrion, Victarion, Barristan, Quentin, and John Connington. To fully grasp the situation in Mirin, it's essential to consider details from all these chapters. The central storyline follows Daenerys in Mirin, the third slave city she conquers. After the chaos in Astapor, she decides to stay in Mirin until it's stable enough for her to continue to Westeros. Her greatest challenge comes from the Sons of the Harpy, a group of Giscari nobles terrorizing the city to restore slavery. They wage a shadow war, brutally attacking freedmen and salid and safe baits, Giscari who support Daenerys, under cover of night, leaving a bloody harpy symbol behind. Several key characters are introduced in Mirin, Reznak Moreznak, the Seneschal on Johnny's Council, Skahas Mokandak, the first and most prominent safe bait, and his Zolorak, a wealthy noble pushing for the reopening of the fighting pits. Despite Daenerys' efforts, including crazy bounties and forming a new guard called the Brazen Beast, the violence escalates. After Drogon kills a child named Hazia and more and Salid are murdered, Daenerys locks up Viserion and Rhaegal, though Drogon escapes and takes noble children as hostages. Zarozo and Daxos reappears, arguing that slavery is natural and trying to convince Daenerys to leave. Meanwhile, Yunkai is preparing for war against Mirin. Garth, bolstered by so many ships, block its trade routes, and cities like Mir, Volantis, and Mantaris also oppose the abolition of slavery. Zara offers Daenerys ships to sail to Westeros, but she refuses, knowing her departure would spell disaster for Mirin. Both Zaro and the Mirinese nobles notice she is reluctant to use her dragons in war and unwilling to harm the hostages, which give them leverage. Galaza Galare, the Green Grace and High Priestess of the Giscari Temple of the Graces in Mirin, who acts as a voice for peace and tolerance in Danny's Council, suggests that marrying Hizdar could stabilize the city. Danny agrees to a deal. If Hizdar can stop the killings for 90 days and negotiate peace with Yunkai, they will wed. Suspicion lingers. Dario even suggests a Mirinese red wedding, which Danny fiercely rejects, but the murders cease for 64 days. However, a plague breaks out in Astapor, refugees flood into Mirin, and Yunkai prepares for siege. After visiting the refugee camp to tend the sick, Daenerys, believing marriage is her best option, agrees and reopens the fighting pits as a part of the wedding agreements. Hisdar negotiates peace with Yunkai under the condition that Daenerys will allow the slave trade to continue in Astapor and Yunkai. Quentin Martell arrives, revealing a secret marriage pact between his sister and Viserys and offers himself to Dany, but she refuses, having already agreed to marry Hisdar. During the wedding festivities, the Yunkai openly show off and trade slaves within Mirin's walls, and Daenerys becomes increasingly miserable. At the fighting pits, Hisdar, who was responsible for providing food for the wedding feast, urges her to eat honeyed locusts, she declines, but strong Belva sits them and falls ill. Drogon then appears, rampaging through the pit, Hisdar orders his death, but Daenerys tames Drogon and flies away. With Daenerys gone, Hisdar rules Mirin. Skahas convinces Baristan Selmy that Hisdar poisoned the locusts to kill Dany, leading Baristan to arrest Hisdar. The Sons of the Harpy resume the attacks, and Quentin dies trying to tame the dragons. Baristan takes over as regent and breaks the peace. The Yunkai hurl corpses into the city to spread the plague, while Daenerys, lost in the Dothraki Sea, struggles to return to Mirin. She becomes ill and has visions before being discovered by Kaljakos Kalasar. 
This is a very quick rundown of the events, but I'll dive into more details where needed in the rest of the video. The Sons of the Harpy, as mentioned earlier, is a group of Giscari noblemen from Mirin, who quickly turned against Daenerys after she decides to stay and abolish slavery. They began brutally attacking, killing and terrorizing the freedmen of the city, including the Unsullied and any Giscari willing to accept the new order in Mirin. The dead man's face was smooth and hairless, though his cheeks had been slashed open ear to ear. He had been a tall man, blue-eyed and fair of face, some child of Lys or old Volantis, snatched off a ship by crosshairs and sold it to bondage in Red Astapor. Though his eyes were open, it was his wounds that wept. There were more wounds than she could count. Your Grace, Sir Barristan said, there was a harpy drone on the brick in the alley where he was found, drawn in blood. The Aneris knew the way of it by now. The sons of the harpy did their butchery by night, and over its kill they left their mark. Grey Worm, why was this man alone? Had he no partner? By her command, when the Ansalid walked the streets of Mirin by night, they always walked in pairs. My queen, your servant stalwart Silt had no duty last night. He had gone to a... a certain place to drink and have companionship. A certain place? What do you mean? A house of pleasure, your grace. A brothel? Half of her freedmen were from Yungai, where the wise men had been famed for training bed slaves. The way of the seven sides. Brothel has sprouted up like mushrooms all over Mirin. It is all they know, they need to survive. Food was more costly every day, whilst the price of flesh grew cheaper. Even so, what could a eunuch hope to find in a brothel? Even those who lack a man's part, they still have a man's heart, your grace. This one has been told that your servant stalwart Sir sometimes gave coin to the women of the brothels to lie with him and hold him. The blood of the dragon does not weep. Stalwart Sir? She said right eyed That was his name? If it please, your grace. It is a fine name. The good masters of Astapor had not allowed their slave soldiers even names. Some of her unsullied reclaimed their birth names after she had freed them. Others chose new names for themselves. Is it known how many attackers fell upon Stalwart Shield? This one does not know. Many. Six or more, said Sir Baristan. From the look of his wounds, they swarmed him from all sides. He was found with an empty scabbard. It may be that he wounded some of his attackers. Danny said a silent prayer that somewhere one of the Harpy's sons was dying in the now, clutching at his belly and breathing in pain. Why did they cut open his cheeks like that? Gracious queen, his killers had forced the genitals of a goat down the throat of your servant's stalwart shield. This one removed them before bringing him here. They could not feed him his own genitals. The Astapori left him neither root nor stem. The cruelty of the sons of the harpy goes beyond mere killings. They brutally mutilate their victims and defile their bodies in grotesque ways, emphasizing their intent to humiliate and instill terror. The harpy sons have even offered a bounty for Daenerys' life, promising wealthy glory and, of course, slaves. I had to come, said Zaro in a languid tone. Even far away in Karth, fearful tales had reached my ears. I wept to hear them. It is said that your enemies have promised wealth and glory and a hundred virgin slave girls to any man who slays you. The sons of the harpy? How does he know that? They skull on walls by night and cut the throats of honest freedmen as they sleep. When the sun comes up, they hide like roaches. They fear my brazen beasts. The Sons of the Harpy have repeatedly threatened the lives of any Giscari who aids Daenerys or the Freedmen, forcing the brazen beasts the city watched to hide their identities behind masks. Their methods are vicious and underhanded, relying on intimidation and fear to maintain their grip on power. Even before Daenerys' arrival, the Mirinese slavers were operating in similar ways. Knowing what happened to Astapor and Yunkai, they never tried to negotiate, like Yunkai, for example. Instead, they retreated behind Mirin's walls, scorched their own fields and poisoned their wells, leaving Daenerys and her followers, 20,000 soldiers and 60,000 former slaves, with nothing. On top of that, they nailed a disemboweled slave child to every milepost along the coastal road from Yunkai, each one pointing toward Mirin as a message to her. The crucifixion of 163 slave children, while they were still alive, was just a display of power. It was meant to spite and break the spirits of Daenerys, and of her followers, but instead of scaring them off, it enraged the starving and exhausted slaves inside and outside the city, leading to the violent storming of Mirin. In the aftermath, many noblemen sought justice from Daenerys for the acts committed by the enraged slaves during the siege. A more peaceful solution was never on the slavers' agenda, even before Daenerys showed up, they were burning crops and poisoning water, tactical warfare, sure, but the crucifixions? That was pure spite and a brutal power play that deserved punishment. All of this is crucial to keep in mind when considering the situation, as I will discuss in the next chapters, but it's important to point out here as well, the Harpy does not care about preserving Giscari culture and customs, as many claim, 
nor do they care about the punishment Daenerys imposed. This become clear in Tyrion's chapters. They say, said Haldon, by they you mean the slavers, the exiles you drove from Astapor and Mirin. Mere calumnies. The best calumnies are spiced with truth, suggested Cabo. But the girl's true sin cannot be denied. This arrogant child had taken it upon herself to smash the slave trade. But that traffic was never confined to Slaver's Bay. It was part of the sea of trade that spanned the world, and the Dragon Queen has clouded the water. Behind the black wall, lords of ancient blood sleep poorly, listening as their kitchen slaves sharpen their long knives. Slaves grow our food, clean our streets, teach our youth. They guard our walls, row our galleys, fight our battles. And now when they look east, they see this young queen shining from afar, this breaker of chains. The old blood cannot suffer that. Poor men hate her too. Even the vilest beggar stands higher than a slave. This dragon queen would rob him of that consolation. The truth is that the slavers, Giscari or not, across this part of the world, have a problem with Daenerys, not because they care about customs, culture, or anything else. If those concerns were even a small part of their grievances, they would include them in their slander campaigns, but they don't. The rumors don't mention her punishments, which were justified, or her supposed disrespect for Giscari culture, because that isn't happening. Instead, they spread stories about her being a witch or having all sorts of weird sex. What they truly care about is money, power, and status things they have long achieved through the slave trade. The Harpy is the conjecture leader of the Sons of the Harpy, first brought to our and Daenerys' attention by Skahas Mokandak. So far, his there has made good on his promises. How? The Sons of the Harpy have put down their knives, but why? Because the noble his there asked them sweetly? He is one of them, I tell you, that's why they obey him. He may well be the Harpy. If there is a Harpy, Skahas was convinced that somewhere in Mirin the sons of the Harpy had a highborn overlord, a secret general commanding an army of shadows. Danny did not share his belief. After Daenerys agrees to marry Hisdar because he stopped the attacks, Skahas rightly questions how Hisdar, if he had no contact with the sons of the Harpy, was able to negotiate with them. And so quickly. Since his introduction, Hisdar has been portrayed as a man who greatly benefited from and supported the previous status quo. He stands to gain significantly from the return of slavery, making his swift success in halting the attacks very suspicious. Magnificence, prompted Reznak Moreznak, will you hear the noble Hisdar Zolorak? Again, Danny nodded, and Hisdar strode forth, a tall man, very slender, with flawless amber skin. He bowed on the same spot where stalwart Seal had lain in death not long before. I need this man, Danny reminded herself. Hisdar was a wealthy merchant with many friends in Mirin, and more across the seas. He had visited Volantis, Lys and Karth, had kin in Tolos and Illyria, and was even said to wield some influence in Gilgis, where the Yunkai were trying to steer anonymity against Dani and her rule. And he was rich. Famously and fabulously rich. And liked to grow richer if I grant his petition. When Dani had closed the city's fighting piece, the value of the pitchers had plummeted. His Zolorak had grabbed them up with both hands and now owned most of the fighting pits in Mirin. Since the abolition of slavery, the cities of Slaver's Bay have faced tremendous economic difficulties as their economies were heavily reliant on the slave trade. If Hisdar and by extension House Lorak were so wealthy in Mirin, it is almost certain that they were deeply involved in the slave trade. Σε αυτό το σημείο να προσθέσω, ο επειδή ξέχασα να το πω την ώρα που έγραφα το script, ότι όταν ο Σκάχας έδωσε τα ονόματα από τα πλοία των Μυρινείς που βοηθούσαν τους Καρθήν για να κλείσουν το ποτάμι, ε, η οικογένεια Λοράκη ήταν μέσα, οπότε ναι, και αυτό μαζί. This would ally them ideologically with the sons of the Harpy. Even if he's there is not the Harpy, his ability to negotiate so quickly with them casts doubt on his innocence. Skaha's family has a blood feud with his there and his house, giving Skaha's personal reasons to want his there out of the picture. However, his there has sufficient motivation to align himself with the Harpy, or even to be the Harpy himself. The existence of a singular leader within the ranks of the Sons of the Harpy remains uncertain. Still, the precision and coordination of the attacks suggest a highly organized operation. Whether the Harpy is an individual leader or a symbol of a broader leadership structure, it is clear that someone with considerable power is orchestrating the violence and chaos within Mirin. Hisdar has a strong case against him, but also he doesn't seem as calculated as the Harpy seems to be. He's quite easy to read, with both Daenerys and Baristan picking up when he's displeased or trying to cover his bat. Be patient, my sweet, said Hister. They're about to lose the lions. Lions? 
three of them. The dwarves will not expect them. The dwarves have wooden swords, wooden armor. How do we expect them to fight lions? Badly, said his there. Though perhaps they will surprise us. More likely they will streak and run about and try to climb out of the pit. This is what makes this a folly. I forbid it. Gentle queen, you do not want to disappoint your people. You swore to me that the fighters would be grown men who had freely consented to risk their lives for golden honor. These dwarves did not consent to battle lions with wooden swords. You will stop it. Now. The king's mouth tightened, for a harpy Danny thought she saw a flash of anger in those blessed eyes. As you command. He's there begun to his pit master. No lions, he said when the master trod it over whip in hand. Was, he says. He believes her dead. Only you can answer that, Magnificence. It might be that you wish to put another woman in her place. Sir Baristan nodded at the girl peering timidly from the bedchamber. That one, perhaps? The king looked around widely. Here? She's nothing, a bed slave. He raised his hands. I misspoke. Not a slave, a free woman. Trade in pleasure. Even a king has needs. See, she is none of your concern, sir. I would never harm the Neris. Never. You urged the queen to try the locusts. I heard you. That being said, the quite sloppy poison attack on the Neris is very heavily suggested that it was orchestrated by him, and it would make sense. He was the one who insisted that she had to dry the locusts, and it was he who planned the feast with his cooks preparing it. A dozen different sorts of meat and fish were served, camel, crocodile, singing squid, liker ducks and spiny crabs, with goat and ham and horse for those whose tastes were less exotic. Plus dog. No Giscari feast was completed without a course of dog. His their cooks prepared dog for different ways. His their had stocked their box with flagons of chilled wine and sweet water, with figs, dates, melons, and pomegranates, with pecans and peppers and a big bowl of honeyed locusts. Strong velvets below. Locusts! As he seized the bowl and began to crunch them by the handful. Those are very tasty, advised his there. You ought to try a few yourself, my love. They are old in spice before the honey, so they are sweet and hot at once. The mystery of the locusts and the poisoner is one of the few things from this upload that is often discussed in great detail. The text heavily points to Hister, since not only was the one who organized the feast, but his whole agenda aligns with that of the slaver elite. Other people who have been suspected are Quentin, Dario, Skahas, uh, Reznak Moreznak, the wise masters and of course the sons of the harpy as general groups. Skahas specifically is a very interesting character to me and one that I truly believe is not involved with the Harpy and would greatly benefit from Daenerys staying in power. The Kandak family is a family that had a feud with House Lorak, one of the slaver families of Mirin, an ancient line that has produced many famous figures and is famously and incredibly rich and influential inside and outside of Slaver's Bay. Unlike the Lorak's house, Kandak is actually a much more humble family, with their pyramid being described as humble, and many of the nobles not having the highest opinion of them. After Danny's arrival, Ska has acquired power that he didn't have before, becoming commander of the Brazen Beasts, which is similar to him becoming commander of the Gold Cloaks. He became a leader of the City Watch and someone who had constant control and access to places he didn't have before. And because of his choice, other less prominent Giscari followed him, because it would advantage them greatly to change the existing status quo. And if the current top dogs benefit from slavery, then their best chance lies to supporting the person who wants to overthrow it. Yes, maybe they don't necessarily care for their former slaves or have pure intentions, but they care for their position and currently supporting Daenerys and her cause is the best way they have to improve their status. They already have put themselves, save Pate in particular, in danger by supporting Daenerys, with Skahas even thinking that if Volantis get involved, Slavery will be their fate as well. Skahas poisoning the locusts for whatever reason is a very poor choice that doesn't help him in the slightest, considering that he was the one urging Danny to harm hostages, something that would very much turn the nobles against him, for sure. The whole conversation with Baristan doesn't paint the safe bait as guilty, but as desperate. Because he is no longer a commander since he's that removed him, no longer has Daenerys backup, and Volantis would probably put him in chains along with his fellow safebates. Throughout history, even the sides that opposed clearly vile humans and rulers also included some very distasteful people in the ranks. The fact that he is cruel and pushes for more extreme measures doesn't mean he wants to sabotage Dani. On the contrary, it looks like he wants at all costs to remove the previous ruling class because it is the safest and most profitable choice for him. Then a shadow detached itself 
from inside an empty stall and became another brazen beast, clad in pleated black skirt, greaves, and muscle breastplate. A cat, said Baristan Selmy. Then he saw the brass beneath the hood. When the safe bait had commanded the brazen beast, he had favored the serpent's head mask, imperious and frightening. Cats go everywhere, replied the familiar voice of Kahat Mukandak. No one ever looks at them. If Hister should learn that you are here, who will tell him? Marcus? Marcus knows what I want him to know. The beasts are still mine. Do not forget it. The safe page's voice was muffled by the mask, but Selmy could hear the anger in it. I have the poisoner. He's their confectioner. His name would mean nothing to you. The man was just a cat's bow. The sons of the harpy took his daughter and swore she would be returned unharmed once the queen was dead. Belvas and the dragon saved Daenerys. No one saved the girl. She was returned to her father in the Black Knight in nine pieces. One for every year she lived. Why? The sons had stopped their killing. His their beast is a sham. Not a first, no. The Yunkai were afraid of our queen, of her unsullied, of her dragons. This land has known dragons before. Yurkas or Yunkas had read his histories. He knew. He's there as well. Why not a peace? Daenerys wanted it. They could see that. Wanted it too much. She should have marched to Astapor. That was before. The pit changed all. Daenerys gone. Yurkas dead. In place of one old lion, a pack of jackals. Bloodbeard. That one has no taste for peace. And there is more. Worse. Volantis has launched its fleet against us. Volantis? You are certain? Certain. The wise masters know. So do their friends. The harpy is not his there. The king will open the city gates to the Volantines when they arrive. All those Daenerys freed will be enslaved again. Even some who were never slaves will be fitted for chains. You may end your days in a fighting pit, old man. Kras will eat your heart. His hair was pounding. Daenerys must be told. Find her first. Skah has grabbed his forearm. His fingers felt like iron. We cannot wait for her. I have spoken with the three brothers, the stalwart shields. They have no trust in Lorak. We must break the Yunkai, but we need the Unsullied. Gregor will listen to you, speak to him. To what end? He is speaking treason, conspiracy, life. The safe page's eyes were black pools beneath the brazen cat mask. We must strike before the Volantines arrive. Break the seeds, kill the slaver lords, turn their cell swords. The Yunkai do not expect an attack. I have spies in the camps. Their sickness, they say, worse every day. Discipline has gone to rot, the lords are drunk more often than not, gorging themselves at feast, telling each other of the riches they divide when Mirin falls, squabbling over primacy. Bloodbeard and the tattered prince despise each other. No one expects a fight. Not now. Daenerys signed that peace, Sir Baristan said. It is not for us to break it without her leave. And if she's dead, demanded Cajas, what then, sir? I say she would want us to protect her city, her children. Her children were the freedmen, Nisa, they called her. All those whose chains she broke, mother, the safe bait was not wrong. Daenerys would want her children protected. What of his there? He is still her consort, her king, her husband, her poisoner. Is he? Where is your proof? The crown he wears is proof enough. The throne he sits, open your eyes, old man. That is all he needed from Daenerys, all he ever wanted. Once he had it, why serve the rule? Why indeed? It had been so hot down in the pit, he could still see the air simmering above the scarlet sands, smell the blood spilling from the men who died for their amusement, and he could still hear his there, urging his queen to try the honeyed locusts. Those are very tasty, sweet and hot, yet he never touched so much as one himself. Selmy rubbed his temple. I swore no vows to his there's Zalorak, and if I had, he has cast me aside, just as Joffrey did. This, this confectioner, I want to question him myself, alone. Is it that way? Damn then, question him as you like. If, if what he has to say convinced me, if I join you with this, I would require your word that no harm would come to his Zolorak unless it can be proven that he had some part in this. Why do you care so much about his Zolorak? If he's not the harpy, he is the harpist Fergon's son. All I know for certain is that he is the queen's consort. I want your word on this. Or I swear, I shall oppose you. Skaha's smile was savage. My word then. No harm to his dad till his guilt is proven. But when we have the proof, I mean to kill him with my own hands. I want to pull his entrails out and show them to him before I let him die. Skahas might be self-serving, impatient, unlikable sometimes, and not the best person either, but he's also very much dependent on Daenerys remaining in power. The safe paid has always been a man driven by ambition and survival, and the fall of Daenerys would likely spell doom for him and those like him who have risen through the ranks in Danny's wake. 
His desperation to protect his newfound position in mid-range shifting power dynamics allies with his ruthless tactics and his willingness to conspire against Hisdar and the rest of Slaver Elite. His motivations, while self-serving, are rooted in a genuine concern for the city's freedmen and the fragile society Daenerys had tried to pull, and of course himself and his family. Hisdar's peace is indeed a sham, a temporary truce that only serves to delay the inevitable class. Skaha's understanding this is willing to take drastic measures to ensure that the progress made under Daenerys' rule is not undone by the return of the slaver lords, and his ass remains alive and not in chains. The tension between Skahas and Hisdar is symbolic of the broader conflict in Mirin, a struggle between the entrenched interests of the old regime and the emerging powers that seek to redefine the city's future. Hisdar, with his wealth and influence, represents a return to the status quo, where the elite continue to prosper at the expense of the many. Skahas, for all his flaws, represents the possibility of change, however brutal and uncompromising it might be. As Kerr has said, if Yisdar is not the harpy, he is the harpy's firstborn son. These are grievous times, your radiance. May I presume to offer you my counsel? You know how much I value your wisdom. Then heed me now and marry. Ah, Danny had been expecting this. Of times I have heard you say that you are only a young girl. To look at you, you still seem half a child. Too young and frail to face such trials by yourself. You need a king beside you to help you bear these burdens. Danny speared the tongue of lamp took a bite from it, shoot slowly. Tell me, can this king puff his cheeks up and blow Zaro's galleys back to Karth? Can he clap his hand and break the siege of Astabor? Can he put food in the bellies of my children and bring peace back to my streets? Can you? The Green Grace asked. A king is not a god, but there is still much that a strong man might do. When my people look at you, they see a conqueror from across the seas come to murder us and make slaves of our children. A king could change that. A highborn king of pure Viscari blood could reconcile the city to your rule. Elsewise, I fear your reign must end as it began, in blood and fire. Then he pushed your foot about your plate. And who would these gods of geese have me take as my king and consort? He's the Zolorak, Galaza Galara said firmly. Then he did not trouble to feign surprise. Why he's there? Skahas is nobleborn as well. Skahas is Kandak. He's there, Lorak. Your radiance will forgive me, but only one who is not herself Viscari would not understand the difference. Galaza Galare is the High Priestess of the Giscari Temple of the Graces in Mirin. The Green Grace is a crucial part of Daenerys' council, serving as a voice for peace and tolerance. She had suggested Daenerys marry Hisdar Zolorak to achieve the peace she desired, acting almost like a mother arranging a marriage. It is clear from Daenerys' lack of surprise that praising Hisdar and pushing him as the ideal consort had become a recurring theme. Wed Hisdar Zolorak can make a song with him a son whose father is the harpy, whose mother is the dragon. Galaza's strong support of the old and wealthy Giscari families and her family's involvement with slavery make her motives questionable. Magnificence, said Resna, consulting his list. The noble Grasdan Zogalare would address you. Will you hear him? It would be my pleasure, admiring the glimmer of the gold and the sheen of the green pearls on Cleon's clippers, while doing her best to ignore the pinching in her toes. Grasdan, she had been forewarned, was a cousin of the Green Grace, whose support she found invaluable. The priestess was a voice for peace, acceptance and obedience to lawful authority. I can give her cousin a respectful hearing, whatever he desires. What he desired turned out to be gold. Danny had refused to compensate any of the great masters for the value of their slaves, but the Mirinese kept devising other ways to squeeze coin for her. The noble Grasdan had once owned a slave woman, who was a very fine weaver, it seemed. The fruits of your loom were greatly valued, not only in Mirin, but in New Geese and Astapol and Karth. When this woman had grown old, Grasdan had purchased half a dozen young girls and commanded the crown to instruct them in the secrets of her craft. The old woman was dead now, the young ones freed, had opened a shop by the harbour wall to sell their weavings. Grasdan Zogalare asked that he be granted a portion of their earnings. They owe their skill to me, he insisted. I plucked them from the action block and gave them to the loom. Danny listened quietly, her face still. When he was done, she said, what was the name of the old weaver? The slave? Grasdan shifted his weight, frowning. She was... Elsa, it might have been, or Ella. It was six years ago she died. I have owned so many slaves, your grace. Let us say Elsa. Here is our ruling. From the girls, you shall have nothing. It was Elsa who taught them weaving, not you. From you, the girls shall have a new loom. The finest coin can buy. That is for forgetting the name of the old woman. The Weavers are mentioned again after this event as victims of the Sons of the Harpy in a conversation between Galaza and Daenerys. I shall pray and make sacrifice. 
Mayhaps the gods of Gish will hear me. Galaza Galar received her wine, but her eyes did not leave Gunny. Storms raged within the walls as well as without. More freedmen died last night, or so I have been told. 3. Saving left a bitter taste in her mouth. The cowards broke in and some weavers, freed women who had done no harm to anyone. All they did was make beautiful things. I have a tapestry they gave me hanging over my bed. The sons of the harpy broke their loom and raped them before slitting their throats. This we have heard. And yet, your radiance has found the courage to answer butchery with mercy. You have not harmed any of the noble children you hold as hostages. Not as yet, no. Danny had grown fond of her young charges. Some were shy and some were bold, some sweet and some sullen, but all were innocent. If I kill my cupbearers, who will pour my wine and serve my supper? She said, trying to make it light of it. The priestess did not smile. The safe paid would feed them to your dragons, he said. A life for a life. For every brazen beast cut down, he would have a child die. Danny pushed her foot about her plate. She dared not glance over to where Graz and Geza stood, for fear that she might cry. The safe paid has a harder heart than mine. They had fought about the hostages half a dozen times. The sons of the harpy are laughing in their pyramids, he said just this morning. In his eyes, he was only a weak woman. Hazia was enough. What good is peace if it must be purchased with the blood of little children? These murders are not their doings, Danny told the Green Grace feebly. I am no butcher. And for that meeting, give you thanks, said Galaza Galara. The murders of the weavers after Daenerys had refused Galaza's cousin recompense for the business of weavers who had formerly been his slaves is quite suspicious. The conversation is taking place with the Green Grace present as well, and in this instance, Galaza is first hand seeing and commenting. The Daenerys doesn't have the guts to harm any of the hostages, something that gave the green light to the Sons of the Harpy to continue the killings. She is in the perfect position to get inside information, and as the High Priestess of Mirin, she has a lot of social influence among the nobles. Galaza urges Dani to take a Mirinese nobleman for a husband and suggests Hisdar Zolorak as her own candidate. Once Daenerys agrees to be betrothed to Hisdar, the murders stop and then start again immediately after Hisdar has been arrested. Although at first glance implicating Hisdar, as it is believed his influence held in the murders, Hisdar was Galaza's personal choice of a Mirinese husband for Daenerys, implicating her in turn. Harpies are females. She is portrayed as the protector of customs, culture, and history of the Giscari. Her family was heavily involved with slavery, and her cousin was already mentioned. Additionally, even though the sons of the Harpy have promised a grisly death to every person who serves Daenerys, Galaza never expresses fear for an attempt on her life or her family's. The only direct attack on Dani we see is the poison locusts, and poison has been described many times as a woman's weapon. I have heard it is said that poison is a woman's weapon. Paisel stroked his beard thoughtfully. It is said, women, cravens, and eunuchs. It is also worth noticing that the execution of the attempt, even though sloppy and unsuccessful, had good timing. Killing Daenerys at that point is actually something that could greatly benefit them, thus they went for it. People from Yunkai were already in Mirin, Karth had ships in the area, and two of the dragons were locked up, so it was possible to remove them from the equation by killing them, and Dragon was absent. It was a great time to try and remove Daenerys from the picture. And of course, the person who advocated for peace and harmony being the Harpy, points out even more that the peace was never real. In reality, Galaza being the Harpy has very few counter-arguments, with the main one being that we believe here and that she is genuine, but without having strong proof to back how truthful she is, while there is a lot that point otherwise. Additionally, other suspicious characters like Resnak Moresnak constantly echo the advice of the Green Grace, or he's there. Even George Martin's use of the color green for Galaza Galare seems like a deliberate choice to me. Green is often associated with growth, peace, healing, and wisdom, qualities that Galaza Galare appears to embody. She presents herself as a spiritual leader, who promotes harmony and peace in a city ravaged by war and unrest. Her title, Green Grace, reinforces the Simans, drawing on the connotations of green as a calming, life-affirming color associated with balance and renewal. But green can also symbolize envy, decay, and poison, elements that reflect Galaza Galare's potential duplicity. If she is in fact a harpy or working closely with them, her role as a supposed peacekeeper is a deception. The green of her title becomes ironic, hinting at hidden dangers and moral decay. Her true intentions, organizing violent resistance and terrorist attacks against innocents, align with the toxic, dangerous aspects of the color green. Because again, green can be a peaceful color, but this piece in Mirin is a rotting green and not a blooming one. Hisdar and the rest of the elite are responsible for a fragile piece that the ex-slaves despise, a piece that's little more than a thinly veiled continuation of slavery. 
The Yunkai can be persuaded to allow all your freemen to remain free. I believe if your worship will agree that the Yellow City may trade and train slaves unmolested from this day forth. No more blood need to flow. Save for the blood of those slaves that the Yunkai will trade and train. This so-called peace doesn't benefit the freedmen or ex-slaves at all. Who is this peace even for? Only the slavers? Like only the 20% of the people who benefit from this horrific institution? Because let's not forget that these cities are described as having five slaves for every free man. Mormont paid no mind to the mongrel crowd. His eyes were fixed beyond the city lines on the distant city with its ancient walls of many colored brick. Tyrion could read that look as easy as a book, so nearly and yet so distant. The poor reds had returned too late. The nearest Targaryen was wed, the guards on the pens had told them, laughing. She had taken a Mirinese slaver as a king, as wealthy as he was noble. And when the peace was seized and sealed, the fighting pits of Mirin would open once again. Other slaves insisted that the guards were lying, that the nearest Targaryen would never make a peace with slavers. Misa, they called her. Someone told him that meant mother. Soon the Silver Queen will come forth from her city, smash the Yunkai and break their chains, they whispered to one another. I am no lady, the widow replied, just Vogaro's hall. You want to be gone from here before the tigers come. Should you reach your queen, give her a message from the slaves of all Volantis. She touched the faded scar upon her ringed cheek, where her tears had been cut away. Tell her we are waiting. Tell her to come soon. For the slaves, this war didn't start with Daenerys' arrival. It began the day they were abducted from their homes and sold to be mutilated and tortured. The peace negotiated by Hisdar is an illusion, a cheap trick that never should have been struck in the first place. As Stephen Atwell brilliantly pointed out in A Laboratory of Politics, Part 6, if the price of peace with Yunkai was to accept the restoration of slavery in Yunkai and Astapor, and the re-establishment of the slave trade across Slavers Bay, then in a very real sense, it's not peace at all. The slaves of Yunkai and Astapor, in their thousands and tens of thousands, will continue to experience not only the perpetual existential violence, of being a slave, but the very physical violence of being mutilated, raped and murdered on a yearly basis, as Danny acknowledges. I cannot see how one can argue that peace of this nature is preferable to war without privileging the lives of the Yunkis and Mirinese nobles, who might die in this war over the lives of the slaves who will suffer in peace for who knows how many more thousands of years. The slavers present slavery as natural, something that just is, a way of life embedded in their culture, even though not unique as they themselves point out. The girl's true sin cannot be denied. This arrogant child had taken upon herself to smash the slave trade, but that traffic was never confined to Slaver's Bay. It was part of the sea of trade that spanned the world, and the dragon queen has clouded the water. Apart from the fact that the vast majority of the people in Slaver's Bay are not Giscari and have their cultures and identities removed, Giscari culture wasn't always only about slavery. What we see today is a shattered version of what once was saved by centuries of decline, conquest and adaptation to external pressures. For centuries, Mirin and her sister cities, Gunkai and Astapor, had been the linchpins of the slave trade, the place where the Thraki cults and the crosshairs of the Basilisk Isles sold their captives and the rest of the world came to buy. Without slaves, Mirin had little to offer traders. Copper was plentiful in the Giscari Hills, but the metal was not as valuable as it had been when bronze ruled the world. The cedars that had once grown tall along the coast grew no more, failed by the axes of the old empire or consumed by dragonfire when geese made war against Valyri. Once the trees had gone, the soil blackened beneath the hot sun and blew away in thick red clouds. It was these calamities that transformed my people into slavers, Galaza Galare had told her at the Temple of the Graces. Sir, sure, slavery was a part of old geese, like it was for most empires, but it wasn't the entirety of their culture. It was not on the industrial scale it is today, it's a remnant, that has survived and amplified not because it is an inherent cultural value, but because it is useful to those in power. Much of the rich heritage has been lost or severely diminished, leaving behind the most exploitable elements. Slavery isn't a unique cultural tradition of the Giscari, it is just a widespread and regrettable historical norm that's been around forever in most societies, both in Martin's world and in ours. And of course, something that is not often discussed, just because something is part of a culture doesn't mean it deserves protection. Respecting a culture doesn't mean accepting every brutal and oppressive practice within it. The abolition of slavery isn't just a cultural shift. It's a matter of fundamental human rights. Slavery has been incorporated in almost every part of life in Slaver's Bay, even in areas where it didn't belong. Bricks and blood build Astapor and bricks and blood her people. 
An old rhyme says, referring to the red brick walls of the city and of the blood shed by the thousands of slaves who would live, labor and die constructing them. Ruled by men who named themselves the good masters, Astapor is best known of the eunuch slave soldiers, called the Unsullied, men raised from boyhood to be fearless warriors who feel no pain. The Astapori pretend that they are the locks the legions of the old empire come again, but those men were free, and the Unsullied are not. The Giscari once mined copper, had timber, and lived in a time when the climate was more forgiving and were profiting off from the earth. Slavery wasn't their main source of income. It became that way after the doom of Valyria. Even the practice of breeding and training slaves, like animals, was adopted from the Valyrians. Before that, they were more like the Andals, enslaving the people they conquered, still immoral, but different from what we see now. The old empire had more to offer, written history, colorful architecture, language, beautiful clothes and art. Even the Tokar, which Danny wants to ban, only has such horrible connotations now because the elite who wear these beautiful ornamented clothes are mostly slavers. The garment itself should represent Giscari culture, not slavery, but now slavers use it to show off who has more power, they make it more uncomfortable, more grandiose, to show off how many slaves can afford for almost every task. The new sigils are a far cry from the original ones of old Gis, where there were once thunderbolts, now there are collars, whips and chains. The titles Good, Wise and Great Masters are self-appointed, and we don't even know whether the people fighting in the pits were slaves back then. Maybe the fighters of old Gis were free men, like the Unsullied, who chose to fight to honor their gods. That's a far cry from the forced blood sport of slaves today. The fighting pits have been a part of Mirin since the city was founded. The combats are profoundly religious in nature, a blood sacrifice to the gods of Gis. The mortal art of Gis is not mere butchery, but a display of courage, skill and strength, most pleasing to your gods. Victorious fighters are pampered and the slain are honored and remembered. By reopening the pits, I would show the people of Mirin that I respect their ways and customs. The pits are far famed across the world. They draw trade to Mirin and fill the city's coffers with coin from the ends of the earth. All men share a taste for blood, a taste the pits help slay. In that way, they make Mirin more tranquil. For criminals condemned to die upon the sands, the pits represent a judgment by party, a last chance for a man to prove his innocence. If anything of what Hisdar claims is true, how do we know the fighters weren't volunteers back then? Yes, it's a brutal custom, but it's different if the participants were there willingly or as a form of judgment by combat. They pampered the victors and honored the slain. Would they have done that for the slaves? Would they have honored the dwarves after they were killed by the lions or the three boys after the bear attack in Astapor? Doubt it. But for free men, it's possible. Maybe indeed the arenas were religious in nature and the participants were fighters who wanted to honor their gods and were honored in return. Ending slavery doesn't mean wiping out this culture. The idea that getting rid of slavery would destroy their entire identity is false and harmful. It's a convenient lie the slavers tell to keep their power. Reducing Giscari culture to nothing but slavery is an insult to what it once was and what it could be again. The elite will train children for brothels because it's our culture, it's the natural state of things, but they do not bother to relearn what little of their own ancient language is still available. Translations of old Giscari scrolls are available. The oldest written history is by the old Empire of Giz. They may not speak the language widely anymore, but the nobles could preserve and learn what has survived. Instead, they cling only to the parts that keep them in power. Sure, the Giscari have weird customs that many would find as savory, like their food, which Danny wasn't a fan of, but no one's trying to change that. Like, if someone doesn't want to eat what we eat in Greece during Easter, no one would care, and it's not disrespecting our culture because you don't want to eat guts. We've seen Giscari who aren't painted as villains. Danny grew fond of her young charges, who were sweet, sullen, shy, or bold, but all innocent. Among the slaves, there are also Giscari people. The elite in Slaver's Bay aren't any more cartoonish than the Boltons or half the phrase who are also irredeemable. They are described as villainous because we see them through the eyes of their enemies. Obviously, they have feelings and care about their families, but their actions are irredeemable. They defend slavery, and some of them seem to enjoy it. Oh, gods, moaned Reznak. He's eating here. The Seneschal covered his mouth, strong Belbas was retching noisily. A queer look passed across his Dark Zolorak's long, pale face, part fear, part lust, part rapture. He licked his lips. Their culture has been reduced to slavery due to circumstances, but that doesn't excuse the horrors they commit. These cities can move forward, 
but it will be hard and violent. No one said it wouldn't. Every political shift brings instability, economic and otherwise, but when the goal is abolishing slavery, it's worth it. Societies and cultures evolve, and it is time for Slavers Bay to do the same. For the Giscari, moving beyond slavery could mean reclaiming and renewing other aspects of their identity. The harpy represents moral corruption, looking backward instead of forward, clinging to comfort at the expense of others, and the slaver elite embodies a vicious cycle of revenge and exploitation. Their agenda isn't about preserving culture, it's about maintaining a status quo that benefits them. A new order challenges this by ending slavery and finding new ways for Giscari culture to thrive. History and culture are important, but so is identifying wrong, correcting them, and preserving the good. The safe baits and the young words are the future and they could help rebuild a better one. The illusion of peace that Hisdar and the slaver elite have created is just that, an illusion. This peace serves no one but the slavers, and Mirin peace was just another word for war. War waged on the slaves, on the freedmen, and on anyone who dared to challenge the slavers. If Galaza is the harpy, these points become even clearer. The Green Greys might represent herself as an old wise defender of history and Giscari culture who advocates for peace and harmony, but she's really motivated by power and control. Her stance is less about tradition and more about keeping a status quo building on blood that benefits her and the other slavers. But peace cannot exist in a society where culture is a shield for cruelty and tradition is an excuse for tyranny. The slaver culture must be removed and only then can Mirin and the rest of the cities begin to build something new. This is it for today's upload. It was more of an analysis of the situation in Mirin and in Slaver's Bay in general, which is a very misunderstood part of the story in my opinion. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And thank you a lot for watching. See you in the next one and until then, bye!